Moving on to the last trilogy of this year's 31 for 31. I swear every trilogy that could have been picked got picked this year. Roni Kenshin is an anime that I'm familiar with. It was one that I watched as a kid, but I didn't cling on to like I did DBZ or Full Metal Alchemist, but I did like it. It's one that I've never really cared to revisit that much as an adult, so I'm not going into these films at all, comparing it to like the anime and I haven't read any of the manga. So we'll kind of take this a little bit as like a fresh lens in a way. But finally, here we are with the Funimation Roni Kenshin live action trilogy. Origins or Roni Kenshin Part 1 Origins is the first film in the trilogy. It's part one of the trilogy if the title didn't make that clear enough. The film is the origins about what Kenshin Himura, a lone ronin wandering around the world that's caught up in the middle of a war and a transitional period where the way of the samurai is dying out in favor of guns and the new way. There's also a kill sword running around under the name of Batosai, killing cops with his sword. Kenshin runs into Karu, who is keeping up her father's dojo and sword school, who he helps defend her school from a drug lord and his gangsta that obviously want to produce drugs at her school. Kenshin, however, has a vow not to kill anybody and even uses a reverse blade on his sword where the dull side is actually facing the slashing side and the slashing side is actually facing what would be normally the, the top of the sword, the, the side that would face him, I guess. Kenshin's whole I will not kill people is an interesting aspect that leads to some interesting choices and fight scenes, but also at times kind of feel like they treat it like a sharpened blade without blood in the terms of the way some people react to getting slashed. I'm I'm sure it would probably still hurt a lot but it is something that i kind of didn't notice that made some of the action a little goofy at moments this is honestly just one of those films that you could just say yeah it was good and just kind of move on from it i had actually seen this one before within the last couple years and i was surprised on how much of the film i remembered considering it's kind of a slightly above average samurai movie it was like one of those ones like as it played along i was like okay yeah i remember this i, I remember this you know what i mean but if you would have asked me before going into it i've been like i can't remember typically anime adaptations are pretty awful. There's a complete language lost in translation moving from one medium to the other. There's very few examples of this being pulled off because through animation you have such an expression through the art form itself. Beyond that you also have like exaggerated action, facial expressions, vocal performances, even down to like the hair and wardrobe style doesn't really translate very well into live action. However with this film they do kind of tone it back from what I do remember from the anime to make it a lot more grounded while still being able to leave some of the more anime stylings in here which feels like a nice flair rather than a gimmick. The film is pretty well shot, costumes look good, and the action choreography is pretty fun, which led to some engaging set pieces despite some really noticeable CG elements. The film isn't afraid to be bloody, even if it is, again, CG blood. There feels like there's some weight to the action. Even when the film is playing off to be a little goofy, there's a sense of vulnerability to its characters that's kind of here in the mix. The main cast are easy characters to get behind. They're not overly complex, but they fit to serve the narrative while also being relatable. One thing I couldn't stand, though, was the music. I personally thought it was awful and felt very garage bandy if that makes any sense but there's moments where the score just felt like it completely undermines the tension of the scene that it's in where it also has like this quirky sound to it that would be played up for more like a cartoon villain and yes the villain is very cartoonish here but not only is like this song or the villain's theme in a way played a bunch but it also felt like it just had to be played every time the villain was on the screen which led to moments where it really cut through the tension in a bad way also most of the dialogue is just exposition dumped which can be frustrating at points. Still, overall though, this isn't a bad film or adaptation from the sense that I don't really remember much about the anime, but more on the sense that it's not Dragon Ball Evolution. You can tell the filmmakers wanted to make a good Kenshin movie, and while it definitely has some dull edges, it's pretty solid overall, and I'm giving this one a 6 out of 10. On to the second film in the trilogy, Part 2, Kyoto Inferno, released in 2014. And I, I don't know what's happening here, but I had actually watched this one before. I knew going into this that I had watched the first film, but I thought that's where I had stopped. The first film was the only film I had rated on IMDb, and within like the first scene of this movie, I was like, hey, wait a minute, I've seen this before. Then as the film went along, I remembered a lot more of the scenes. I'm guessing what had happened was I kind of just blurred this and the first film together, despite there being different villains. There were scenes when I was watching this film that I thought were actually 
actually in the first film, but somehow when I was watching the first film, I never realized, hey, there's scenes I remember missing. It's weird, but hopefully I haven't seen the third film, but we'll see, I guess. Any Baduzo, Kyoto Inferno follows up from the events of the first film. When Makoto Shishio shows up, a samurai covered head to toe in bandages because of his burns. The evil sword slinger wants to topple the country of Japan when Kenshin is asked to help take him down. Honestly, Shishio is a badass villain. His opening scene, despite not being too much, does insulate him as a force. He brings so much fire with him, he might as well be taking on The Undertaker. There's some really cool visuals throughout the movie, but especially that ending set piece where everything is burning, it just looks sick and epic. The action is pretty well handled. Again, the film does lean into CG, you know, CG blood, CG fire and everything, but it does look decent. It's better CG than the first film. One thing I really noticed in this film was how much better the makeup was. The makeup along with the wardrobe is just really well done here. My biggest complaint is the film doesn't really stand on its own. It really does have that middle film syndrome. The story of the film doesn't really have a conclusion, but is left open to clearly need a third film to close it out, which kind of left the experience feeling somewhat empty at the end. There's also a definite lull in the middle when Kenshin goes to get his new sword that I personally felt like took away from the main plotline. There's moments where the film tries to be a big blockbuster feeling kind of movie in sections, but for the most part, it's like way too small scale to sell that, so it feels a little bit scaly inconsistent. There's also this blonde haired character that I really hated the performance of. Like, yeah, I know this is based off a of manga and anime, but nobody else here is really playing into it that cartoonishly. Like, yeah, the first film has some goofy characters but this person's performance is like Tommy Wiseau level oh hi Mark anyway how is your sex life I just couldn't wait for his character to be off screen. Outside of that, a lot of the humor in this film just landed short for me. I'm just not into that quippy kind of superhero Marvel kind of humor. I just don't find it funny or natural. While we did get to explore the new villain that I really enjoyed, we didn't really get much of anything with Kenshin himself in this film. Kenshin is more or less just here to save the day. The last film, we kind of learned about his identity. We learned his ways. We saw him struggle at certain moments with maintaining his path. And the only thing this film really does with Kenshin is just kind of hit on some of the same beats as the last film and not really explore anything new, which honestly made his character really forgettable despite being the title character. I know I had some negative things to say about this one, but while I found the first film to be fun, slightly above average, but somewhat forgettable, I found this one to be a lot more fun with a much more compelling villain and some really cool scenes. Despite me mixing up the first film and this film in memory, I'd definitely give this one like a 6.5 out of 10. It's probably closer to a 6 than a 7 in total, but a 6.5 out of 10. Hopefully the third film will be new to me. Attention deficit disorder on to the last Kenshin film, The Legend Ends, also released in 2014, brings the story arc with Kenshin and Shishio to a close. And guess what? I actually hadn't seen this one, so noise! The film opens with a young Kenshin as he finds his master, jumping to present day, that follows up the Kyoto Inferno. Kenshin seeks his master to regain his will to live and to overcome Shishio, that will eventually lead up to the climax finale against the mummy man himself. I say eventually because boy howdy did this film just meander to get there. At one point I thought they just totally forgot about Shishio. This first act is just a slow grind that wastes so much time. Like in the end, it doesn't even matter. But no, seriously, we spend like nearly half the runtime with this pity party Kenshin when just another character comes up and is like, hey, yo, yo bitch ain't dead. And he's like, bet. You wasted so much of my time to try and teach Kenshin to overcome this guilt and grief only to strip it away by saying, nah, man, you good. And he was like, fine from there on out. Like, seriously, this character literally learned nothing. You wasted so much of my time. Anyway, from there, Kenshin just kind of meanders for another 40 minutes or so until we finally get to that climax. Honestly, coming off the heels of Kyoto Inferno, I had high hopes for this one, and you could almost completely cut out the first and second act of this film and staple the third act onto the end of Kyoto Inferno, and it wouldn't have made any difference in terms of the story. It actually probably would have just been better. Nothing here feels developed. You're only insisting things are bad. You're not showing anything that you didn't already show in the second film. You don't spend time building characters. You don't spend time building an arc. You don't spend time building a f***ing narrative. You spend time doing nothing and then solving it with one line of dialogue, basically. I know I'm going a little hard into this one with what my final rating will actually end up being, because honestly, heading into the third act, this was like a flat 2 out of 10 for me. I just did not care about this film. I was bored. I was kind of frustrated with where the narrative was going. But then we get to that third act of the film. It saved the entire f***ing 
fucking movie. The third act in this film is probably the best thing in the entire trilogy. First off, the action's handled pretty well like the other two films, but the fight scene with Shishio at the end is so fucking cool. Shishio feels like a monster of a man, a true threat that feels almost impossible to overcome. The man is throwing around more bodies than Brock Lesnar at the Royal Rumble. Mix out the stuff he uses for like the fire attack things and it just looks awesome. I know it's CG fire, but it's a good effect that's pretty well done. Shishio is just a great villain that unfortunately didn't get the screen time he deserved to build him even more in this movie. The film barbacks too much off of Kyoto Inferno rather than using the extra time here to do something new and exciting. It was great to see the entire cast basically trying to bring down Shishiro. And honestly, you're not sure if they're going to do it. It's inherently compelling action that really sucked me into it, finally letting me get something out of this runtime. I understand the film was trying to build Kenshin as a broken warrior, but comes off more as a pity party with a resolution coming in the form of just news and not the actual character learning something. Sure, they try to tie that into the back end of the film that he actually did learn something, but I don't buy it. It's not genuine and it's not interesting. This time around though, I think this is probably the worst music in the series. The music just straight up feels like stock music and at times doesn't even sound well produced, almost like a low res rip or something. <laughs> it's distracting at some points. But like I said, this was like a two or a two and a half out of 10 going into the third act, which really ended up turning the film into a five out of 10. That's just how satisfying that ending is. So yeah, I'm finally putting away the Roni Kenshin live action films. I'm glad I can finally cross these off my... Wait, there's two more Kenshin films released on Netflix? <laughs> well, it's a good thing this series is only about the films I... Uh Well, I did it. I figured if I was going to cover the original trilogy that I own, then I might as well cover the last two chapters of the film or series as well. Roni Kenshin Final Chapter Part 1, The Final, which is a heck of a title, is part one of two films made back to back. The film begins with the supposed end of the Kenshin story. I say supposed end because at the time of writing this, I haven't watched Roni Kenshin Final Chapter Part 2, the beginning. This time around, we pick up after the original trilogy as Anishi shows up with a vendetta against Kenshin, bringing Kenshin's past back to haunt him. This this film plays into more of the backstory for Kenshin actually giving way to Kenshin's character to grow and learn, but also allowing us as the viewer to dig a deeper insight into Kenshin's story and how he developed his life philosophies. It's basically what the third film tried to do. And you know what? God, <coughs> if it wasn't better than the previous three films. This is some good <coughs> samurai shit and it's not even on Blu-ray. You probably don't need to watch the other three films to follow this film's story, but it does kind of have like this weird payoff feeling for watching the other films. It takes all the positives and brings them here, even improving on them and takes most of the negatives and tries to correct them. First off, the action is a lot harder hitting here. The violence feels bloodier and gorier. Action just feels more gruesome. The makeup and the effects are pretty great. The wardrobe and some of the character designs look solid, but there are some downright beautiful shots in this film that just look great to the best of Netflix's bitrate chagrin. But what I was really lacking from the past films were the characters. Most of the supporting cast from the previous films are here as well, but are more just supporting and don't have a lot of focus. We spent a lot more time with Kenshin and the villain Inishi. Kenshin and Inishi have a strong history together, which made for a more emotional and compelling plot to help bolster the action. In one movie, we develop Kenshin more than three movies combined, giving him more personality and deeper dimensions. We not only learn about his past but his scars leading way to understanding his motivations of the last three films and it does kind of feel like it corrects a little bit from the first film of the because you see him get one of his scars in the first film so i feel like it kind of like sidesteps that to go into more detail to develop it more his character now has depth which allows you to latch onto him even more it's a story about grief and forgiveness a story about morals and principles blanketed around some badass and super fun samurai sword fighting this leading to an ending that feels like a great send off for the trilogy. It's a nice conclusion that feels like a reward for going through all of the other films, but that doesn't mean it's a perfect film. My biggest complaint really comes down to a couple of things. While I do think the music here is better than the original trilogy, it's still rather forgettable and at times feels like temp music. Another minor complaint was also like the zombie-like clan that worked with Inishi that just kind of felt way too cartoonish for what the film was going for tonally. The film feels a lot more grounded and scaled back, but then these guys just kind of stand here 
and it's yeah, it doesn't really clash very well. Like, yeah, it's not outlandish in the realm of the other Kenshin movies, but considering this film's tone and story and what they're going for in this film, it does feel odd and clashing. My biggest complaint would just have to be the Yakuza-like crime syndicate that's working with Anishi. It just really felt underdeveloped and only here to serve as a plot device for later in the film that kind of felt like it undermined the overall plot between Kenshin and Anishi. No spoilers, but there's a moment at the end with the boss, like dude that I personally hated and I felt like it took away from what the film was trying to build. So though, I kind of went into this one without a ton of hopes considering that even though I did like the original Kenshin film so far, none of them really had that razzle dazzle, but here we are. I do think this is the best of the live action Kenshin films so far, but we still have chapter two or uh, sorry, final chapter, or sorry, Roni Kenshin final chapter part two, the beginning, but I'm going to give Roni Kenshin final chapter part one, the final, a seven out of 10. Finally, the fifth and last Roni Kenshin film, Final Chapter Part 2, The Beginning. This film being a prequel to the other four films, but also a tie-in counterpart with the fourth film. This time around, we follow Kenshin as we see how he got these scars, what led him down his path that he would end up taking in the other films of this series, from meeting and marrying his wife to how he became the feared Batosai that helped usher in the new age. I gotta be honest, this was my favorite of the entire series. Not only do we get all the positives of the other films, but they're elevated here, much like in the last movie, movie, they're constantly improving. The fight choreography is snappier and more fluid. The cinematography and framing is great. The lighting is on point. The violence feels grounded, consequential, and brutal. But we also improve on where the other films falter, just like the fourth film. We have a richer character in Kenshin, allowing us to fully explore him and get a deeper understanding of why he's the way he is that impacts the rest of the series. It helps elevate the rest of the series when you're watching Kenshin. There's an emotional core here between his wife about revenge, forgiveness, and trying to find peace. The looming war is set as a nice backdrop to allow political chess that impacts not only Kenshin and his relationship, but also the world they're living in. It feels like a believable world and the shadow operations actually have sway. With all that glazing though, there are some noticeable issues. For one, the acting. The acting in this series has been good, but watching this one kind of made me realize that it's good for the stories that were being told. This film tries much harder to have much more emotional weight, and I'm not sure the acting is up to snuff to carry that weight. Wait. There were times that characters would be crying or upset that kind of felt unbelievable, like you are clearly just acting right now. The film can be serious and it can have some fun moments as well. But this film though is much more serious than the other entries when it comes to trying and reach that emotional peak that even though it's trying, I don't feel like all the actors could quite get there. There's also inconsistent frame rates where the film would have nice smooth slow motion at points and then kind of choppy at others. This happens when you don't shoot in a high enough frame rate. And my guess is they didn't originally shoot some of these scenes in a higher frame rate and instead decided to make it slow motion in post, which can look jarring compared to the other times when it has nice and smooth slow motion. Some of the other films did this too, but I definitely feel like it's more prevalent here. Again, the music wasn't anything special, but it didn't stand out in any way, good or bad. The other thing that I really love about this film is that even though it's a prequel, it feels like the final chapter in the story. There's a nice sense of closure despite the film basically ending where the first film starts. By the end, it just felt like a complete experience and a great way to head off the series. Choosing to tie this in very heavily with the fourth film felt natural and smooth, which led way to kind of feeling like a nice final chapter chapter in this Roni Kenshin live action franchise that's a truly satisfying one and I'm giving this one a seven and a half out of ten. The Kenshin movies have definitely had their ups and downs for sure but I definitely had a good time with this trilogy or series I don't know what, what do you call them when they get to five? I do wish the last two Netflix movies would get a physical release so I could own the full franchise especially considering I think they're quite a bit better than the first three but this is how you adapt an anime or manga. Bye!